Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Common Frontiers, Council on Hemispheric Affairs, Friends of Latin America, Interreligious Task Force on Central America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast weekly at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink's YouTube channel. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Telegram, and now at radindymedia.com. Today's episode, the impending U.S. invasion of Haiti, and I'm really honored and pleased and excited to um, have our guest, Jamima Pierre of Black Alliance for Peace. As some of you know, we've tried a number of times to have her join us, and so here she is with us today. I want to tell all of you a little bit about her. She's got an impressive resume. She is Associate Professor, Department of African American Studies and Department of Anthropology, University of California, Los Angeles. She is a sociocultural anthropologist whose research and teaching interests are located in the overlaps between African studies and African diaspora studies and engage three broad areas, race, racial formation theory, and political economy culture and the history of anthropological theory and transnationalism, globalization and the diaspora. She is the author of The Predicament of Blackness, Post-Colonial Guyana and the Politics of Race. So welcome, Jamima. Really an honor to have you with us today. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. I would, um, let me give the audience a, a brief background of what um, we're gonna talk about today. Uh, on Monday, October 17, thousands of protesters across Haiti, oops, sorry, <laughs> I lost my audio there. Thousands of protesters across Haiti protested, the, uh, forced the, re or the resignation or protesting the resignation of Prime Minister Ariel Henry. The protest started hours before the United Nations Security Council held a split vote over sending an international force to Haiti to help with deteriorating security and a surge in cholera after powerful gangs took over the main port and blocked fuel deliveries. The government had been awaiting a response to Henry's recent request for the international community to help set up a, quote, specialized armed force, unquote, to quell the violence, which has worsened in the power vacuum created by the 2021 assassination of President Jovenel Moise. The United States and Mexico said on October 17 that they are preparing another UN resolution that would authorize, quote, an international assistance mission, unquote, to help improve security in crisis rack Haiti so that humanitarian and desperately needed uh, medical supplies by millions of people could be delivered. Petroleum stations uh, have remained closed. Hospitals have slash services and, and as well as businesses, including banks and supermarkets have cut their hours as everyone across the country runs out of fuel. So Jamima, let's talk about this um, intervention that seems to be coming. And there's a lot of euphemisms that Mexico United States and UN have used um, to create an, uh, an intervention. And maybe for the audience, it'd be really good for you to talk to us about the significance of October 17th in the history of Haiti, because this is a really important date. And um, not just for Haiti, in my opinion, not just for Haiti, but for the hemisphere as well. And we don't talk enough about this in the hemisphere. Right, so um, October 17th is important because it was the anniversary um, um, of the assassination of Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who is the father of the Haitian nation. Um, he uh, took over the revolution after the French captured um, Toussaint Louverture, who had helped begin the, the revolution against the French um, and against slavery and colonialism in 1791. Um, and he took over once Toussaint Louverture was captured by the French in 1803, and he was assassinated by rivals um, in 1806. But after he declared Haiti independent and a republic, and so and and wrote the constitution. And so 
I think it's really um, uh, amazing that, uh, and I, I don't even think that this was an accident that they would choose this date, um, the U.S. and um, and its um, I would call them minions and its and its people um, uh, in in creating this to have this conversation where they would think they were thinking about they're thinking about sending an armed uh, group um, to intervene into Haiti at this moment, and so it's really. Which is which was which is really seen as an affront to the to the Haitian people. They were very um, not frustrated but angry um, uh, at the audacity of the U.S. At, at this particular moment over this meeting in particular, but in general um, since the protests have been going on at this point for ten weeks. So this particular set of protests has been going on for ten weeks, but there have been a series of protests in Haiti over. <laughs> more recent years, I would, you know, probably 300 years, really, Haitians fought for, for their freedom and have continued to fight ever since. It's, they've never been fully recognized as sovereign people, at least, and not with their dead and not with their, with their lives. But there's been a series of eruptions, protests, like for the last three to five years. So to me, from the outside looking in, this is uh, a series of protests of, of the Haitian people expressing their frustration with external interference and really pushing uh, for their sovereignty to be respected. That, that's correct. And I do wanna say one of the things that emerges from the, uh, the Western media around the current, um, um, what they wanna call crisis in Haiti is the fact that they actually have not highlighted the protests. What they've highlighted, were, um, they've hidden the protest under the discourse of gangs um, mm -hmm. and, and, and personalize it to one gang member. Um, uh, and, and um, you know, the, that's the way the US does, right? It demonizes one person. And then, you know, that, that becomes this, like, the boogeyman um, for intervention or bombings or drones and so on and so forth. And so I, I call this the Bin Ladenization of, of, of these young men in Haiti. But um, th so the protests have been going on for 10 weeks primarily, and this is key, and this is why it's not mentioned in the mainstream press, because uh, the Haitian uh, de facto prime minister, which was installed um, by the US in the core group and not elected, removed fuel subsidies um, from, 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 from for Haiti. Um, and this is something um, that the US has been trying to do for a long time. And so, and I would mm -hmm. like to point people to, um, uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary for the region, um, Brian Nichols, who admitted just yesterday in an interview um, on CNN that when they asked him why the U.S. supports Ayo Ali, he says, quote, he has ended fuel subsidies, which is something we have wanted to see in Haiti for quite some time. And I respect him for that. So that tells you everything where it's, you know, the shame of this thing is that the fact that you dismiss the principles of basic good politics and policy when it comes to Haiti. How can you praise a government for cutting subsidies that led to 130% increase in prices among the global economic crisis, right? And so, so to put this in context, you know, the average uh, uh, minimum wage in Haiti is about $2 a day, right? Um, gas prices were about, I think, three or $4 a gallon. Um, with the removal of subsidies, the prices are now $6 a gallon. And people are making two dollars a day, and it's outrageous. And one of the key reasons why um, one of the uh, young men who are blocking, who's blocking one of the key oil uh, 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 areas um, in in Haiti, he say until the subsidies are put back in place, he's going to block everyone, right? And so that's so one of the things we have to know about is the U.S. insisting uh, insistence of really killing Haitian labor. Um, and he's, they, they've done that over and over again, you know, um, just a, uh, maybe about 12 years ago, the WikiLeaks files reveal how the Obama administration tried to prevent the government from raising Haitian minimum wage to $5 a day, right? And so, and so these, are, these, these are like bread, bread and butter issues that the Haitians are, are protesting and they're protesting and they want this um, prime minister gone. They want him to step down because he's a puppet and he was installed without, um, he has no legitimacy. He was installed by foreigners, and but also he's been able to um, 
you know, remove the subsidies. And the reason there were protests, and I have to say, you say the past three to five years, there were protests in 2018 when Jovel Moïse, another illegitimate president, tried actually announced that he would remove the fuel subsidies. And so everyone took to the streets. And so it was so politically bad that he actually didn't do it. But they, the U.S. was able to get this Arya Henri guy to come in and do it. So that's really the key to the protest. But also general frustration of interference. Um, you know, one of the, and, and I guess we could talk about this later, but the reason that there's a, there's a, a, a security issue is because there's been about 700,000 guns dumped into Haiti um, uh, coming through private ports. And these ports are owned by the Haitian, well, I don't know if we want to call them, but the non-Black oligarchy, they're mm -hmm. transnational oligarchy that lived in Miami, in France, different places in the Western world that own these ports. So there's no way that you have guns coming through Haiti without, without the people knowing, without the U.S. knowing. The guns are coming from the U.S. And so there's been a dumping of, of guns into, into the, the, the area, into Port-au-Prince, and that's really caused an increase um, in um, young men who have nothing to do. They're being given guns by these, you know, by these um, political parties, by these oligarchs to fight one another, to protect their assets in the country. So that's really what's behind the insecurity um, that could be fixed by actually just stopping the, the guns from leaving the US and getting to Haiti. But instead, what the US wants to do is actually send um, an armed mercenary force really to, to basically prop up this completely illegitimate and unpopular um, prime minister that they installed. So what I am hearing, understanding, is that these 700,000 guns, this is, this is a way to destabilize the country internally, the yes. gang violence, and then the gang violence that's being manufactured, that violence is being used as the excuse right. for an international force to intervene. So it's a manufactured crisis, which is not unique to Haiti in my opinion. Right, exactly. It's not unique to Haiti. And I wish, and I always say this, and I say, you know, if people didn't exceptionalize Haiti so much, they would see the patterns, you know? And I was yes. talking to a group um, just yesterday, an older Caribbean um, activist group, and they're saying, well, the U.S. did the same thing in Jamaica in the 80s, just dump all kinds of weapons into the country. And so, you know, Jamaica's violence is out off the chain compared to compared to Haiti, really, or even Mexico. And that's the most most I you know ironic part. You, know, you have these cartels controlling things, but yet, you know, you have Mexico trying to send a, a force to Haiti. But one of the one of the key things to, to 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 think about is the intervention. I want people to really know what the US is trying to propose here. And and I, and Haiti is the is the 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 laboratory for US foreign policy experiments. Right, because it is through the Global Fragility Act, which was passed by Donald Trump in 2019, which is the new foreign policy template for the US. And what the Global Fragility Act says is that they're trying to find a way to use allies in the region to, um, they're like, they're, they're gonna focus on fragile countries, fragile states um, that are violent. And they're fragile as defined by the United States. Exactly. Or as, as manufactured. Made fragile, <laughs> yeah. Right. Manufactured right. And so exactly. Yeah. And so the whole point then, this new foreign policy is is a combination of the Department of State, the Department of Defense, and USAID. This is the mm -hmm. new model, and I hope people look up the Global Fragility Act. It's a new model for foreign policy where you basically deploy local forces, you know, around and use so-called um, local based um, solutions. And, and then um, uh, local uh, allies to actually work to bring security and safety to, this different, uh, to these different countries. And so what's happening with this Global Fragility Act is that the US chose five countries um, and guess which is the first country that they are trying it on? <laughs> Haiti. <laughs> so, Haiti and Libya are the first two countries oh. that they're gonna try the Global Fragility Act. And so I want to talk about the intervention because one of the key problems, one of the key things that should shock us all is that, you know, Haiti has had a long history of intervention and Haiti is still under occupation from the 2004 uh, coup d'etat that was led by Canada, France, and the US, and then hidden 
by the US uh, chapter seven peacekeep, so-called peacekeeping operation where the UN still runs Haiti. So the, the forces left in 2017, but they left the core group, which is run you know, in the BINU office, which is run by Helen Lalee, which is the office that actually led the charge on October 17 to ask for a foreign occupation. But this foreign occupation is different than the UN one is because they were very specific in saying that they want a non-UN multinational force. And you have to wonder why it is that they would want a non-UN force and they want a force of mm -hmm. like almost like the coalition of the willing mm -hmm. of having, you know, of, of not, you know, so we hated the UN occupation, but to have a force that's not under the UN mandate actually makes it even less legal. And they're, you know, so the, the legal realm of the legal parameters of these then become very confusing, right? And so basically it's like getting a coalition of countries willing to send troops into Haiti, armed troops that are, you know, but without the purview of the UN. That to me is a bunch of mercenaries going into Haiti um, um, and, and doing that. And so, but the Global Fragilities Act is such that it basically says it would do something like that. So right now, we, what we see happening is that I think we think that the US, they're having trouble getting the Western countries to provide troops, but they've already convinced the CARICOM countries, the Caribbean countries to provide troops. So all in line one after another, the past week you had the, the Haman government, the Trinidad government, the Guyanese government saying that they are willing to send troops into Haiti. And that is a recipe wow. for disaster. So let me ask, the UN still has a mission there, troops there. Okay, so well, they, the, they have they have police there. They said they removed all right. the troops, and the, the the mission supposedly finished in 2019. But the UN office, the Bino office, is still there. Yes. Okay, so there's still a presence there with police. Now you're going to introduce a non-U.S. Western, a non right coalition Black countries. Right. Yeah, I'm shocked about Paracom. Well, maybe maybe not. No, you shouldn't be. No, maybe <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. Um, so listening to this, let me just ask you, are we seeing, to me, when I see uh, a coalition, non-UN, Western, I, I have to say, to me, this is almost like watching what's playing out in Europe right now, uh, an East-West thing. Proxy war. Yes, and uh, an East versus West, or a Eurasia versus the international community, Western. Uh, and, you know, it may also play out in other parts of, of uh, the Americas as well, with Colombia being a NATO global partner and Venezuela being ne right next door as a Russian ally. I mean, are, is this like growing or maybe it not growing, growing, but becoming it's... more and more visible, I guess? Maybe. Yeah, but it's also using proxies everywhere so that U.S. troops yeah. don't have to be on the ground. And then you have to link this to military exercises because one of the things that the goal is to use soldiers from these, but with US equipment and US training, right? So right. then it makes sense. Then you have the Southern Command that's been having military exercises every year. So Operation Trade Winds, which is a military ex set of military exercises that, have, that, have, that they have every year that includes all these Caribbean and some Latin American countries in the area where they have exercises right off the coast of. Venezuela, right? Mm -hmm. And so that tells you what, what, so you wonder, so why they're doing these exercises every, so that these countries then can, can fulfill the role of the US without, so it doesn't look like you have white people going into um, Haiti like you've had in the past in 1915, where, you know, it was like mm -hmm. the white races from the South um, invading Haiti. Now you can have black and brown folks from the Caribbean and, and, and elicit some African help, right? You can send these black troops to kill black Haitians in, in Haiti. And that to me is, is distressing and, and we should all be outraged. So, oh boy, I've got like a whole list of questions now for here. I've been scribbling down. So the Southern Command has been off the coast of Venezuela in, in international waters, but very close to the coast. That was expand their that's like a full fleet there now, I believe, not just right. regional, but a, that's been expanded to a full fleet. Um, the oils, the, the oil subsidies, the fuel subsidies in Haiti, is that part 
of Petro Caribe. Is that part of the Venezuelan uh, oil program? It was historically, it's not any longer. Is that my Right, so that they've, they've always they've had um, the, the fuel subsidies predate the Petro Caribe, as far as I can tell. The Petro Caribe is a separate program, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, I'd have to double check of whether or not it predates. But you know, for people who don't know, this was under Hugo Chavez, one of the true friends of Haiti, um, of Venezuela. Um, and you know, God, God rest his soul, I wish he was still alive. Um, um, a lot he, of us. You know, <laughs> Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. And so yeah. um, he created this fund for the Caribbean nations where when oil prices was, uh, were really high, um, uh, basically providing oil to these nations at major discount at a loan of 1% interest with that, they, that they did not have to pay for 25 years. Mm -hmm. And so then these nations would buy the, would take the oil, sell it, and then use the profits for development projects. And the US, and, and so Rene Preval, who became president and signed on to the Petro Curry, really the US wanted him out because they were uh, very upset that he actually went behind his back, their, their back, and signed this deal in 2006. And they've been trying to get rid of Petro Curry for the longest. And they got, they got out of it once they installed um, Jovenel Moise, who was able, you know, who got out of the Petro Curry uh, program. Um, which would have been very helpful, but at the same time, not before the the PHTK, the party that Hillary Clinton helped put in place, Michelle Martelly uh, from 2010, um, stole about $2 billion worth of that money that was set up, and which is why you had protests oh, okay. um, from the, 2019 okay. to 2020, mm -hmm. saying all these elites stole this party, mm -hmm. this political party that was pushed onto people, all of them became extremely wealthy off of this Petro Caribbean money. Okay, that's the missing link for me. So there's my <laughs> light goes on. That's the missing link for me. I did with uh, okay. So um, so what is um, or I had one other thing I wanted to ask about um, find my notes here. I'm sorry. So with this uh, non. UN multinational force and it mercenary. And listening mercenary force yeah and I I appreciate you using that word versus contractor I hate <laughs> I just right. that <laughs> euphemism that's used in the West contracted yeah well when I was a kid they were called mercenaries and I think mercenary, they right. still appropriate it's still an appropriate term a realistic term what um so what sort of, aside from the um, protest in Haiti, what sort of protest pushback is happening in the region or globally? Or is Haiti on, on its own in this? Again, I as think Haiti, so yeah. often is. Yeah, I think Haiti is on its own, even though I, I've been heartened the past couple of weeks by how many people um, in the US have finally turned to Haiti and um, have been really pushing against um, invasions. And so you have people in Haiti, you know, there've been protests since that, since the day of October 17th, protesting against the UN plan to send uh, a force. Um, there've been nonstop protests against a foreign invasion. Everyone is against the foreign invasion on, on, in Haiti. And one of the key things is, you know, the US is saying that the Haitian government asked for a foreign invasion. Let's be clear, there is no Haitian government. There right. is an installed puppet minister that was asked, and I have to implicate the OAS, which Castro rightly mm -hmm. called the Ministry of Colonies, where it was Luis Almagro, the right-wing OAS Secretary General, mm -hmm. that tweeted on October 6th, after he had come, come to Haiti to support, and Almagro has supported every terrible dictator slash whatever in Haiti, you know, from, from the very beginning, right? But he's the one that tweeted after meeting Ariel Henry, he tweeted that the Haitian government should ask for international support to help with this issue. The next day, Ariel Henry formally asked, you know, on behalf of the Haitian government, <laughs> on behalf of Haitian people for an armed military intervention. And so it's, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous because people are protesting and say, well, this guy has no mandate. He's unelected. 
he has no, you know, the only thing that's holding him up is U.S. power. That's the only reason he still has a position in Haiti, and it's not a recognized position. So how could he ask for foreign intervention? So Haitians are constantly protesting this, but there have been a lot of people, you know, I mean, groups here, you know, you have um, a lot of groups, a lot of grassroots have been writing a lot of um, um, event, uh, a lot of uh, press releases, statements about this, against this intervention. There have been some in-person protests um, in all over the cities, uh, and I can't really name all the groups, but there have been quite a number. Yeah, there have been, been some in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there have been some in Europe, and I hope they continue because um, what's happened as a response, uh, one of the key things that happened during the vote, though, is that China and Russia actually pushed back against the idea of an armed intervention. And part of the, you know, and I think there's a large, there's a Haitian group that actually wrote to China and Russia and asked for the veto. So did we at the Black Alliance for Peace. We actually directed specific letters. We de hand delivered letters to, to, to them in Washington, D.C., asking them to vote no against intervention. So they brought this um, up saying, well, how could you have an intervention when there's an illegitimate president? That's what the Chinese um, representatives said during the meetings. But what we see happening, so even though now I think it's great, there's a tension to this. And we thought things subs subsided for a bit, right? Once they decided on sanctioning, which is ridiculous, sanctioning these individual um, so-called gang members as opposed to the people who finance them, which are the oligarchs, right? Um, but then, despite the fact that the vote did not go through around the international in in intervention, the US has been nonstop working. So today, for example, you have the Pentagon chief and the Canadian uh, defense minister meeting to talk about a plan for Haiti. And then you have Brian Nichols announcing that by early November, they will find a force to go in and take care of Haiti. So they're relentless, you know? So even if it, the, the point is, even if they don't get the UN Security Council go ahead, they've already decided because Canada sent a group of people today They've, you know, Canada sent a plane full of equipment two weeks ago. And so people are saying, um, my sources on the ground are saying that Canada and the US are gonna provide logistics and the Caribbean and some African countries are gonna provide troops. So this is when we actually wow. need to stand up and protest even more. Listening to you, I mean, I, it's, it sounds to me that this international force, this non-UN non -UN force, because the UN is already there, China and Russia as part of the UN, UN Security Council, do not support intervention. So this is really very clearly a workaround from the UN. A workaround and that maybe, they will continue to use later. Ex exactly. exactly. And specifically a workaround from China and Russia's position. Exactly. So once and that's works the global in Haiti, piece. they will use it elsewhere. Exactly. That's, that's why we say Haiti piece. is the yeah. Haiti is the lab. They can try mm -hmm. and get away with these things. And so now that they're so upset because they've been so frustrated by the vetoes with China, you know, especially Russia's vetoes, right? Um, and I think yeah. I think that's the way to bypass the UN while still claiming to be working with the UN. Yeah. Basically, basically bypassing Russia and China. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah, that's part then, of the Global Fragilities Act as well. It right. mentions Russia and China at the end. Yeah, and the whole Eurasia project versus the, inter the West or the quote unquote international community, which right. is all of five countries out of 192. Right. Yeah, wow. This is like fascinating and also really uh, scary. Awful. Yeah, it's really, it's horrifying. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do in the States, a lot to do. And so let's talk about um, work to do in the States. You mentioned um, so many different groups in the States that are, you know, have protests, statements, letters. Black Alliance for Peace uh, has written a letter to the president of Mexico. And maybe we should talk about that because I am talking with you from Mexico City. <laughs> and, um, you know, we love the president here, but like with any government, you know, not ev not everybody gets it right, and sometimes there are also splits, as we're clearly seeing in the states uh, within the government. And so, what is what are you? Uh, you've written a letter. Black Alliance for Peace has written a letter um, addressed to Lopez Obrador, and can you share with us the content of that and and what we can do to help uplift uh, your concerns? Right. And 
And I have to say this letter was, an, was actually um, an open letter to, um, that was signed actually by a number of organizations um, that we were able to get a, quite a number, I think about 40 um, organizations mm -hmm. to sign on with us um, against, uh, 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 to talk to AMLO and just basically say, um, this, is, this is not the way to go. But one of the key things that I don't think people realize the way that, first of all, the UN is an undemocratic institution. And if we begin with that premise, because you have five <laughs> permanent seats, veto right. power, and so on, right? So, and it was, you know, the history of the UN is linked to, you know, colonialism and the League of Nations, and it's really was set up to maintain European hegemony in the global, in the international community. So I, I want to begin there. But so then what, what ends up happening is that the US really, you know, the UN Security Council has 15 seats, even though you have the five permanent seats, but you have rotating right. seats. And, and this is how the US has been able to actually exert it, it influence because you have the, the three African nations, you know, uh, in the rotating seat, and they think they can curry favor the US if they go along with, with the plan. And who are those but Mexico's, three? I think it's Gabon, Kenya, uh -huh. I don't, the third one, maybe Ghana. I have, I'd have to double check. Yeah. So those are the three African nations. They vote along the US. Mm -hmm. um, Mexico also has a rotating seat. And, but Mexico is what's considered a co pen holder in, in the UN Security Council. And co pen holder, their role is basically to help, um, they foc they're, they're, they're focused on, on one specific issue. So Mexico is the co pen holder for Haiti. And what it does is, is a copen holder for the U.S. with with the U.S. So the U.S. these permanent um, seats they work with different um, uh, countries that are on the security you know rotating seats on the Security Council to take on an issue. So Mexico took on an issue, which means that they write all the resolutions around Haiti. They work with the U.S. to come up with the U.N. plan. And so Mexico was very key to writing this resolution that you know pushed for an armed multinational invasion of Haiti. And they were key to renewing the UN mandate last year. We saw that, um, you know, they, so they write mm -hmm. the, so they work, they work in cahoots with, with the US. And so we were, when we found this out, we were extremely frustrated and, uh, and shocked because AMLO is, you know, a leftist president, right? Everybody's excited. He's trying to yeah. nationalize lithium and, and, and he speaks a good game, right? In terms of, if you think about his statements against, you know, the, the, the blockade against Cuba and sanctions regime against Venezuela and so on and so forth. But at the well, same time- Well, and his whole vision for regional uh, integration for Latin America and the Caribbean. It's, exactly. It's but very exciting it was, and very appealing to a lot of people. Exactly, and but that's the thing, right? And so, and it was similar to Brazil in 2004 with Lula, right? It's mm -hmm. like Brazil was this, you know, leftist, you know, government growth of power. And then Lula was promised a seat on the Security Council if they took over the, the military wing of the UN occupation. And so then Haiti becomes the, the training ground for these people to try on their military, but to also assert, assert their, you know, their power in the region. And so I'm afraid this is exactly what's happening with AMLO. And that's exactly what's going to happen with the CARICOM countries, using Haiti as a site to train, right, or to to mm -hmm. to promote themselves as a leader in 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 the region, and so almost like Palestine is used in the Middle East. Exactly. So 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 this so that's that. So we we wrote to Amlo and say, you know, we understand. You know, we're excited. You know, we were excited that you know you over the years he's emerged as one of the more progressive voices in the hemisphere. Um, you know, we applauded his commitment for you know, trying to forge new equitable relations between nations and the peoples of the Americas, especially against Western bullying <laughs> and dominance. And so we told them that we should, for that reason, he should not allow himself to carry out US and Western neo-colonial policies in Haiti. And so, and we said, since you support self-determination, you should also support Haitian self-determination. And so, so then we go, we went into the letter and explained what's been going on since 2004, the coup d'etat, um, the UN occupation, what the UN forces did to Haitians, right? The cholera, which is the other thing that's mm -hmm. disgusting is the fact that it's the UN forces that brought cholera to Haiti that killed up to 30,000 and sickened a million but because they dumped fecal matter into the, the rivers of Haiti. 
but now they're using cholera as an excuse for another for an invasion, right? So they brought cholera. They never. They it took them six years to acknowledge that they brought cholera. They never paid restitution. They never fixed the water system that they broke. But now they're using that as a way to come back. And so, so there's that. But also, what Amlo was been frustrating is his negotiate his work with Trump in militarizing the borders in Chapatula, in mm -hmm. allowing this remain in Mexico policy, in allowing the, uh, uh, you know, the, was it the 22, something about the COVID, um, I forgot the, the name of it, but working aside, alongside the U.S. to stem migration into the U.S. and militarizing. We're not white know, migration into the U.S. Non-white, right, because, because the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians just came right through. <laughs> With the, yeah. with, with the roller boards, they came in with their bags and so on and so forth. But, yeah. you know, yeah. I've been to the U.S.-Mexico border and I've been there, you know, you have thousands of people living under a highway waiting to be, you know, waiting to uh, um, uh, come up for asylum. And so, and then Chapatula now, he's, you know, they're stopping them at the bottom of, you know, the southern border of Mexico um, and bringing out the military. And so yeah. we're saying, well, why are you doing this on behalf of the U.S.? Does Haiti not matter, right? And so, and, and and we and we said this to CARICOM as well because, you know, if if all if you're asserting uh, self determination, all nations should be able to chart their own just destiny and not just some. And so, and we also said, you know, you must know the history of the proud Haitian people whose revolution changed the course of the world. And um, and 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 the, and the thing is, Mexico should should contribute to ending this occupation, not to extending it. And that's, the, and that's the letter we sent to him. And, you know, we handed the letter in person in the embassy, in Mexico, but also we emailed it and we sent it in Spanish. <laughs> so oh, hopefully great. somebody yeah. read it. <laughs> so you delivered it in person in DC or here? In DC, in DC. In DC, to the embassy in DC. To the embassy, the and then we emailed it. Yeah. To, to the president's office here in Mexico. I mean, it, it is fascinating because, and, and disappointing, I guess, because, yeah, Mexico does have a really, uh, in, for me personally, a fantastic vision for regional integration for Latin America and the Caribbean. And that was really overt uh, during the CELAC summit, September of 2021, that was held here in Mexico City. And it, it's, it's confounding to me also because Mexico's foreign policy is based on non-interventionism. That's the history. Right of the country. And then honestly, that's one of the things that I enjoy living in this country so much is that it's not a warring nation, but I'm I'm a little wrong in that. <laughs> so then what happened? Yeah. What, that's what we say when it comes to Haiti, all of that leftism collapses. I mean, I, yeah. and, and so we have to, yeah. we have to figure out why that is, why that yeah, is that for sure that it's okay to trample on Haitian sovereignty and dignity, but not others. Why do you think that is? I mean, what is your? I'm not sure. I think you know. I I think there's a way that Haiti's exceptionalized. I think it has to do with race. I think um, yeah. definitely. I think this black nation is demonized even among other black countries. And if we only need to review the immigration policies of the Bahamas, of of Jamaica, mm -hmm. of Guyana, to see you know how terrible Haitians are treated. But also, there's a 200 years of like demonization of Haitians um, in the Western media. And I think people have bought into that. And so from the beginning of the revolution, you have the Western media reporting all kinds of terrible things about Haiti and Haitians. You have people in the Caribbean, Black people saying, oh, those are the Vodou people, right? We don't want to have anything to do with them. So I do think there's something about the exceptionalizing of Haiti. I think it's winning the uh, revolution, um, uh, it's winning its independence as early as it did but also it's being portrayed as like these savages that basically killed yeah. all the whites in Haiti. Um, but I also think there's an anti-blackness that, that comes when it comes to thinking about um, sovereignty. And I think the exceptionalization does not allow room for seeing Haitian people as like real human beings. And the, 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 their treatment is actually very similar to the treatment of other people in the region and in and, and, and the world. What's been interesting to me is you know, in tweeting, I've been tweeting a lot about this against mm -hmm. this invasion the past uh, month or so is Yemenis coming to my timeline saying they did the same thing to us. You know, yeah. this is the same thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we, it's if we really, again. exactly. If we yeah. saw Haiti as like a normal group of people that are not exceptionalized as being so different, then we'd actually be able to actually make these connections 
and really truly have like an anti-imperialist um, um, praxis um, that would include everyone and not, you know, just exceptionalize this little country. I just want to mention for our audience, I will include in the program notes, uh, Jamima's social media uh, handles, and I'll also put the link, Jamima, of the Black Alliance for Peace letter um, into the program notes so people can, can reference that, and the audience can reference that. So in our last few minutes, what, um, what can we do? And how do you see, or maybe I should ask first, how do you see all of this unfolding? Is it going to accelerate? And I, yeah. No, you think so? I mean, do you, are, I think are it's you going anticipating to an invasion? I, I am. I, and I just got an email um, um, from a friend there saying that they're, they're planning to use CARICOM um, soldiers. And so, and that's, you know, I, the US is relentless. Yeah. when it comes to Haiti and it's shocking to me because they manufactured this 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 crisis and the reality is you know there there have always been like young armed men in Haiti the past at least the past 20 30 years where politicians arm you know these young guys don't have anything else to do they don't have money they're poor so you know the the, the elite used to use them to to settle scores with you know with their enemies and so on and so forth so there's always been, you know, a, a, an armed element. It's not as bad as Mexico. It's not as bad as Jamaica, which is why it's fascinating that this crisis has become, has become such a worldwide crisis. But it builds upon the idea that Haitians are savages and can't rule yeah. themselves. So everybody believes, yeah. you know, Haiti is about to collapse. It's like when this president was assassinated last summer, they're already calling for intervention back then right. because they're like, this place is about to collapse. And people were calm. Nobody did anything. It's like, oh yeah, the president got assassinated. These people kept moving, right? But I think I think what's going to happen is that they are going to do that, and it's going to be a bloodbath because these young people are so angry. Not just these young people, everyone, including my mother, who's like, you know, older conservative Christian lady, who's just like, how dare they think that they yeah. can send armed invasion um, um, to to Haiti? So everyone's up in arms, and I actually think these young guys are going to fight back. And to me, this is going to be a bloodbath yeah. because everybody is so mm -hmm. against this intervention and everybody's saying 2004 is not the same as 2000, 2022 is not 2004. They're not going to sit by and let these armed people come in. So that to me is the scary part. Um, and then, of course, if people fight back, then the U.S. is going to come in and really use a lot of force. And that's my worry. Um, and I think what we should do right now, I think all of us, is to really get louder and push against this impending invasion. Reach out to CARICOM in, in particular, you know, Black Alliance for Peace. We've also written an open letter to CARICOM. We've been trying to lobby, um, you know, and, and I think we need to really push and be loud and push against this intervention because what it's gonna do is cause more trouble and also push for the US to leave Haiti alone and stop meddling. And I know people are saying, well, things are so bad, what can we do? You know, don't you need the intervention to, to de unblock the, the, the gas. And I'm like, no, actually just leave Haiti alone. If, if the UN left, if everybody left, we would figure it out. And we have not been allowed the opportunity to figure out our own, um, uh, our own destiny. And so just really ask for people to say no to, uh, no to invasion, get out of Haiti, leave Haiti alone. And that's what, that's really what we want. Respect the sovereignty. Yeah, and sovereignty does not exist in the U.S. foreign policy lexicon, in my exactly, opinion. <laughs> exactly. We have yeah. self-determination for the entire yeah. region, and everyone yeah. should be allowed um, the space to determine their destiny. Let me ask you just one, one more question be before I let you go: Is the end game here with Haiti to turn Haiti into a U.S. a, a Caribbean U.S. military base? Well, you know, the U.S. has been wanting uh, a military base in Haiti since the 1800s. I don't know if you know, yeah. there's this small island called Mole Saint Nicolas that they actually sent Frederick Douglass, who was um, the U.S. Uh, foreign minister oh, in the late 1800s. Well, that's a fascinating story there. <laughs> yeah, and so they um, they sent, um, and, you know, I, I make a plug for my partner who has a great piece in the Boston Review called Frederick Douglass in Haiti, and he talks, he recounts this history. Um, but they were they sent him there to to negotiate this island off of the north coast of Haiti because the US has been wanting to have a base there, which is why they ended up in Guantanamo Bay. They mm. couldn't get this island. The Haitians have been have said no. 
Um, so there's that. There's also oil, right? And so, yes. you know, one thing my mother will say is, you know, you go to the south um, western part of Haiti, there are these ships drilling oil off the coast of Haiti, and the local people have tried to go out to the sea to ask them what they're doing there, and they're they're turned away with guns. So you mm -hmm. have the oil drilling, you have the mineral rights that are being given away to, to, to foreigners. And so you have a, a, a lot of things. But I, but I do think the end game is to have you, Haiti as a strategic location for the U.S. to establish itself, because that's the only thing that explains the fact that Haiti has the yeah. fourth largest U.S. embassy in the world, right? And so if Haiti mm -hmm. doesn't matter, why would the U.S. do that? Mm -hmm. And so I think they want to have it as a staging ground, because as they prepare to deal with, you know, to, they think they're going to deal with China as they prepare to engage mm -hmm. China. Haiti provides a way yeah. to go through the Panama Canal to get to the end of the Yeah, all of that. Stopping, stopping the new Silk Road. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, Jamima, what a fabulous conversation. <laughs> I should, where so are much. you today? Well, we should let the audience know where you're talking to us from today. <laughs> I'm in Dakar, Senegal, West Africa, and it's amazing. I'm here for a conference, so. Oh, great, wonderful. great. Well, thank you so much for making time to talk with us today. I learned so much, and, and I, I'm assuming our, our audience has as well. I'm going to post again, as I uh, mentioned earlier, I'll post your Twitter, hand, your social media handles in the program notes, the Black Alliance for Peace letter. And you know what? I'm gonna uh, post that Boston Review article it's too. an amazing article. piece yes it is. <laughs> yeah. it is i've read it and yeah. it is it's fascinating and it's a, a piece of history we don't learn about in the united states and we don't hear yeah. about yeah so thank you so much uh for joining us i want to uh remind our audience you've been watching what the f is going on in latin america and the caribbean code pink's weekly youtube program of hot news out of the region we broadcast every wednesday sometimes thursday depending on guest availability uh, 7 30 p.m eastern you can also find us on apple podcasts and spotify and i should also remind you to listen to code pink radio which broadcasts 11 a.m eastern uh, out of new york city on wbai and uh, washington dc on wpfw that program is also available on apple podcasts and spotify so thank you everyone a huge thank you to you jamima i'm so thankful for our conversation today and uh, Thanks enjoy so much the for rest of me. It's my pleasure. I'm Thank trying. You. It's already evening, so yeah. It's, <laughs> What's it's the time difference? It's like seven um, hours, I think, between you and me. Yeah, I think it's well, it's four hours for Eastern time, but um, seven hours for Pacific okay. time. Yeah. Okay, and I'm two, so five. I get five yeah. for two, two okay. six come fall. So, okay. Thank you again. Okay. Very right. much Thank appreciate you, the conversation. My pleasure. Take good care. You too. Bye-bye.